Hello, everyone, and welcome to PlatformCon. I'm super excited to be here. Well, be here. Um, platform engineering and platform teams have been a huge interest area of mine for a long time, and it's great to see so much momentum happen. My name's Nigel Kirsten. I'm field CTO at Puppet, and I've been hanging around the DevOps space for a long time and working on the state of DevOps report as one of the primary authors for the last 10 years, which feels like a very long time. So with that, let's get into the presentation. So I kind of hate it when people give talks and they sort of have this long meandering build up to a point and then finally sort of hit you all at once. So I'm just gonna give you the end of my talk at the beginning, which is my whole thesis is we need a platform engineering map and model that's prescriptive to help people get started. Otherwise, most people will stay lost. And I think we've seen these sorts of mistakes being made in previous transformation movements like Agile and DevOps. And particularly, we've seen that these things start to fall down in the enterprise space. So let's go back to basics at the very beginning. This is a pretty incomplete model of how visual perception works. And it's true for other kinds of perception as well, auditory perception, you know, sense. This idea that there are these objects out there in the world and this raw unfiltered data comes through and just hits these various kinds of sensory organs that we have and goes straight to the brain. But the thing is, this is a pretty incomplete story of how perception actually works. Because it turns out perception is a really active process. We have three main stages that cognitive scientists go through and when they describe this, we select in that there is so much stimuli out there there are so many different bits of data coming in and out that we have to actually filter it out to, so that there's a small enough data set so that we can actually extract some meaning from it. Then we organize the stimuli that's coming in and put it into sort of cognitive meaningful groups and so that we can reason about those groups. And those groups, we then interpret. And that, act, that process of interpretation makes use of our experience, our skills, our expectations, all sorts of things. If you have a look, this is why, you know, witness statements when it comes to crimes are often somewhat unreliable and you can have 10 different people watching the same incident and coming out with very, very different interpretations about what actually happened. I'm personally really, really colorblind in more than one way, but my red green colorblindness is particularly, particularly bad. And I've had partners tell me, you know, when I'm saying, where is that red jumper that I'm looking for? They're like, well, do you mean that brown jumper? And this is where you find that perception is actually quite cognitively penetrable, as cognitive scientists say. The brain is actively involved in it because I know that I'm sort of a little bit dodgy when it comes to perceiving different colors. And so when someone tells me who I trust more, that thing's not actually red, it's brown, I start seeing it as brown later on when I go and observe that object. And all of this is true of perception. There's this big mess of stuff out there and our brain is actively involved in filtering things out, categorizing into groups, and then interpreting it. And so why is this relevant? Well, let's jump into the dress for, for a moment here. So the dress is made a bit of an internet phenomenon that some of you may have thankfully escaped when it came out a few years ago, where someone posted a photo of a dress and said, hey, what color do you think this is? And it turned out a large group of people saw it as a white dress and a large group of people saw it as a black dress. And this all depended upon interpretation, whether you were looking at that picture and thinking, oh, that's in daylight and it's in this certain kind of light, or whether you were seeing it as being something that was actually in like artif under artificial lighting. And your brain automatically would go and subtract those differences of colors before you go and make an interpretation as to what color it is. So this whole process that we're going through requires interpretation and we need models to make sense of these things. That process of organizing things and interpreting things requires us to have mental models, to have frameworks, to have all sorts of things that we use as cognitive crutches to make sense of the mess of raw data that's actually out there. And some philosophers actually go to a pretty, have a much stronger stance in this, which is not just that we use these things in language and we use them in sort of action, but that our actual ability to think and the way we conceive the world and the way we do absolutely everything fundamentally is metaphorical in nature. 
And if you're interested in this sort of a topic, George Lakoff is sort of the preeminent philosopher linguist in this space and has written an absolutely fantastic book called On Metaphor that goes through a lot of this stuff. And you'll find it probably make you a better designer and better builder of systems to have a good understanding of how people actually use metaphor when they think about things. And computing progress is driven and proceeds and advances by useful metaphors. You know, look at the desktop. It was this incredibly pervasive metaphor for all of our desktop computing until we all ended up starting to use our phones and watches and other kinds of devices much more often. This was a particularly resilient metaphor that enabled computing to move beyond the sort of high, you know, small group of people, the high priests of technology to become much more accessible to office workers who it was a familiar metaphor for. And they could go, ah, oh, I'm producing a document. I'm moving it into a folder. I'm putting it in the bin. All of these sorts of things aided in the progression and expansion of technology so that more people got value out of them. But sometimes we get these models wrong. This is one of the big consulting groups, you know, agile frameworks and all of the different things you need to absolutely think about. And this is what I want to talk about today, why I think that it's really important that we come up with the right kind of model when we're talking about things like platform engineering and perhaps avoid some of the missteps that we made with Agile and with DevOps in our industry. So one of the things we did when we did the State of DevOps report uh, last year because it would have been the 10 year anniversary is I had the pleasure of interviewing a whole bunch of luminaries in the industry. And one of the you know, most preeminent is Patrick Dubois, who was sort of the godfather of the whole movement, very much nurtured and moved it along. And I collected all sorts of great quotes out of that interview. And one of the things he talked about was this one here about how this really resonated for me as someone who was involved in a lot of those early DevOps days, which was that there wasn't really a plan for what it was. There were a bunch of like-minded people who saw that something was fundamentally broken in how we built, released, and operated software. And there were a bunch of practitioners who were interested in going, you know, there's new technical capabilities, there's new ways we can think about things as far as how people interact with each other. And so these DevOps days all got together, other sorts of grassroots movements, and people shared stories. And a lot of this became emergent. It emerged out of this space and all of these community interactions that people had, and all of these different things emerged from it. And this was great. It meant there was a really good source of innovation. It was really vibrant. It was really interesting. Lots of people could latch on to in all sorts of different aspects of it that they found interesting. But as he points out here, you know, people who are new really struggled with DevOps. And I've spent the last four or five years like working pretty heavily with very traditional organizations, trying to help them get better at enterprise DevOps. And the reality is, is that no matter how much work we've actually all put into this, most people have a pretty poor understanding of what the movement is actually about and what they should actually be trying to focus on. Some of these things that emerged out were, they were things that not quite models, but at least sort of metaphors in some sense, thinking about ways to describe philosophies of how we would approach this whole system and perhaps focus areas. So if you look on the you know, left-hand side here, we have Gene Kim did put it together the three ways of DevOps, of system thinking, amplifying feedback loops, have a culture of continuous experimentation and learning. And then you saw that, you know, Damon Edwards, John Willis, and then later Jez Humble came along and came up with the CALMS movement of culture, automation, lean, measurement, and sharing, which is a really great way of describing the sort of focus areas of how you can approach these kinds of problems. But none of this was a prescriptive model. None of this was really helped people go, I am in a very traditional environment. What's the very first thing that I should be doing? And if you go and look at somewhere like Reddit's DevOps subreddit, and I don't mean this in a pejorative way at all, but if you go and look at places like Reddit and see how people have conversations around DevOps, it's very, very different to, to environments like this one. Like all of you are here at PlatformCom, you're enthusiasts, you're intellectually stimulated by these sorts of topics. You're interested in the movement and how it all works. And that is absolutely fantastic. And these are my favorite communities to hang out in. But I think we always need to keep in mind that there are a lot of people out there who this stuff is just a job and that's fine. They do it because it puts food on the table. They get to go home to their families. They may have other interests. They're perfectly good at their job, but they're not passionate about it. And I think that's absolutely fine. And, but we see that for this group of people, when they're adopting these new things like DevOps, 
they really, really struggle with it because there isn't really a prescriptive model. And these days, DevOps engineer is about the most useless job title I can possibly imagine. You could be running CICD, you could be a cultural consultant, you could be essentially running different projects. It, it could be anything. And so I think what we've seen is that people struggle with it in the absence of a prescriptive model. We tried to do this somewhat with the State of DevOps report. So we spent a lot of the first few years working closely with the Dora folks. We came up with the Dora metrics as they get known these days, those are the big four metrics. And those things are great to focus on output and in terms of actually sort of optimizing what you've already got. But they, again, weren't really helping people get started. And so in 2018, we tried to come up with a maturity model, evolutionary model, and I think it's pretty good work and it's pretty useful. But by then I think it was just too late. There were too many vendors who saw this huge, vibrant community of people who are really interested and in trying to change things and said, our software, yep, that's totally DevOps. And all of that started to distort and mutate the whole movement so that expectations and understandings became a little more difficult for people to reach. We saw this, I think, similarly with Agile. You know, the Agile folks wrote down a manifesto and it's a pretty simple manifesto, but again, it's a philosophy, it's a way of doing stuff. And I, and I know that was the explicit intent, but again, in the absence of a prescriptive model for Agile, this huge movement that fundamentally transformed how we all write software, we see people producing things like this. The big consultants came in and went, hey, this is a big movement, we can attach this with good intentions. But I think just as software vendors are going to produce stuff to get you to buy their software, it's perfectly reasonable, consultants are going to produce stuff that requires a whole bunch of consulting. And so you end up with these big, relatively complex, inflexible frameworks, which in many ways I think runs counter to the actual spirit of Agile. So this is ultimately my thesis, that if the people with experience on the ground, that's you if you haven't been paying attention, don't step up and work together to describe a prescriptive model, the big vendors and consultants will fill the gap. And not all vendors are created equal, not all consultants are created equal, but I think when there's huge commercial interest in a space, you know, the natural distortions of capitalism are going to take over and you're going to see these not particularly ideal outcomes. So what do we want out of the right model? What we want is something where there's space for new practices to emerge, but that there's also has specific and concrete approaches. It needs to be useful for new people to get started, but it also needs to be have enough room in it for innovation to occur. Because, you know, if we look around all of the people who are at this virtual conference, even if everyone today decided this was exactly the right model and exactly the right things you should be doing in terms of platform engineering, it's going to change over the next year or so. And the pace of technology and the pace of innovation is just changing faster and faster and faster. And so you have to leave some flexibility baked in. But at the same time, you can't just assume people are going to pick up on all of that context. Platform engineering is a relatively new community compared to a lot of these other communities of practice that have emerged in this space. And we've seen some really, really great work come out of here. But I think what we've got to see is that the people who are going to come along in two years time, three years time, the people who are working in much more traditional and infrastructure environments, much more traditional businesses than perhaps some of you work in, they're not going to have all of that context. And you've got to work out some way of packaging that up so that folks are all roughly moving in the same direction. Now, there are good models out there. And let me just fix the focus on my camera. There we go. There are really good models out there. If you look at, you know, I know Manuel's talking today um, or talking at this conference. I am an unabashed fan of what they've done with team topologies. And I think this is the right kind of descriptive level that you want. You want to have a high level framework that's relatively easy to consume with a bunch of prescriptive guidance in it that folks who believe in are going to keep building up and building up so that as less and less sophisticated users adopt these things, we're building things up so that they're all coming along for the ride. I think this is about the most important thing to be thinking about in these early days of what I think is genuinely a transformative approach to running infrastructure, to running applications, to doing software delivery. This whole idea of having value stream teams, self-service platform teams, bringing a product mindset into the platform space, all of these things are fantastic. And I'm not going to sit here and outline all of them because I'm a massive believer in them. And honestly spend a lot of my time consulting with big companies trying to get them to adopt these approaches. 
But as we keep building up this body of work as a community, I think it's absolutely critical that we keep in mind the people who are going to be coming along later and the people who are going to be coming along with less context, in less sophisticated environments and with different use cases. So again, call to arms, all of you who are doing this work, who are working closely with the different vendors, who are building out platform teams and are doing this stuff well, take part in shaping a prescriptive model. Otherwise, I worry that we will end up in the same slightly cynical spot in a couple of years that we've ended up in with DevOps and with Agile, where there's a little bit of a sneer sometimes when people start to talk about these things and they're going, ah, you know, that rubbish that I've heard about from some particular vendor. There, I think there is a path forward, which involves practitioners being deeply involved, working with folks like the Team Topologies folks, producing their own material, talking about how they're succeeding and how they're failing in a way that lets us avoid all of the mistakes of the past. Call me a little bit of an idealist, but I think it's actually possible. And with that, that's the end of the platform. Thank you.